Welcome to PartialArc.com. Don't do that. I'm here to save the day. I'm here here to save the day. Soon I will be invincible. (laughs) Because, 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 because comics. Welcome to Because Comics. This is episode five. I'm your host, Jay Jones, and I'm joined by my co-host, the Double Dutching Mike Christensen. Double dutching. Yeah. I don't even know what that means in this context. Double dutching is when you're taking the two jump ropes. I think two, and you kind of loop oh, them together. Someone's on the other side, so and how then you jump I... in the middle, and then you double dutch. And that's just what I do? I'm, I'm just the double you dutching You are a double Mike. dutching master. I don't know how you found out about that, because I've taken very careful pains to make those records sealed. <laughs> the podcast just cuts <laughs> out right there. <laughs> just men in black suits. <laughs> thump, thump, thump. Where, where, where'd you get that? <laughs> <laughs> because comics with your host Dan Buda and Mike Christensen. It's just like did Jay. What happened? What happened to Jay? Just dead. Hi, with your host Jay Jones. Hello, I'm Jay Jones. Hello, I'm Jay Jones. With the of automatic I voice am. filter. It's just a robot. <laughs> Mike and a robot. Oh, that's uh, too bad. Uh, it's too bad knowing that this would be better if I was a robot. If <laughs> if I was. Hypothetically. Hypothetically. There's still time. There's still the future. <laughs> There's still time for me to be a robot. The day's Mike. still young. <laughs> Come on, guys. All right. Well, so here we are. <laughs> back on track. No. Episode, no, not back on track. Episode five. Um, and we're going to be diving into the Zipotles. That's right. Every episode, we talk about what we're reading these days, what comics are on our list. And Jay, why don't you start us off? Yeah. My uh, comic this week for the poll list is going to be Batman Eternal. Mm-hmm. Batman Eternal is written by, well, primarily written by Scott Snyder and James Tyrion the Fourth. Um, right. There's also a bunch of consulting writers on this, which might sound a little odd to have so many writers on one book, and I'll explain why sure. if you haven't heard about it. And the also there's a there's also some guest uh, artists every now and then, but I guess the main lead artist is Jason Fabok Fabok F A B O K. Oh, okay. Fabok. I have no idea. Yeah, it sounds good if you if you say it really fast. Jason Fabok. Yeah, we'll right. just say it with that conviction. Works. Jason Fabok. Jason Fabach. Sure. Of course. Of course it is. Yeah. It's um, conviction. But so the reason why there's so many writers and guest artists on this one um, story of Batman, of this comic run called Batman Eternal, is because it is a weekly comic. Mm-hmm. So it is, they're constantly pumping these things out. They have exactly a year plan. So very much in the same yeah. line of 52. Mm-hmm. How Batman Eternal opens is basically some shadowy figure of course has returned to (laughs) gotham um we don't know who it is but we're hinted at that this is a villain that we have seen before that we at least know of so of course as a batman fan like myself i'm playing the whole first issue of who is the main villain is it joker no because they just did something like that is it gonna be two Is it gonna be you know whatever scarecrow scarecrow why not right yeah or is it gonna be hush god forbid it's hush (laughs) but um you never know so kind of going through the whole rolodex of batman villains and they do a pretty great job at misdirection. So how the issue opens up is Batman's doing his whole Batman thing, chasing down a regular villain. In this case, it's Professor Pig. He's kidnapped a bunch of kids. There's drugs. It's bad. Of course, Batman's there to take care of it. <laughs> also, I, just, I love the synopsis. He kidnaps a bunch of kids. There's drugs. It's bad. <laughs> it's drugs. It's bad. It's Professor Pig. Of course. So Batman's in there to fight. Also, of course, just like kind of his uh, Starsky to his hutch, if you don't get that reference, watch a bunch of buddy cop films. <laughs> We've got Commissioner Gordon, who's there. Sure. Right there in the fray with Batman, trying to rescue these kids. As always, the commissioner who is just at the front line of every fight, because of course he is. Why not? Um, he's very hands-on he's commissioner. He's very hands-on yeah. commissioner. Well, I think that's very much a product of the movies more so than... Because yeah. he I used mean, to be just the old guy who was Don't around. get me wrong. I love... Big stash Jim Gordon right at the front line commissioner. Yeah. I mean, but it is it is really funny. Yeah, that's but, true. So he's right at the front. He's helping Batman chase down these kids and Professor Pig to save them. Pretty standard scenario. Sure. So Batman gets sidetracked with one of the villains, and the Jim Gordon chases one of these lackeys down into the subway. Mm-hmm. Now we see this lackey like saying something on a phone or a cell. I can't exactly remember, but something seems slightly off. You can't really tell, but everything's slightly off in the first setup of a huge series, right? You're kind of going back and rereading sections. I'm sure it'll be important later. And he runs into the subway tunnel and Jim Gordon chases right after he pulls out his gun, you know, stay, stay right there. Don't move. Don't move. And the guy's just standing there like, 
oh, oh, and he looks a little freaked out. He looks a little confused, and Jim Gordon's yelling at him, put down that gun, put down that gun. And the guy's, I don't, I don't have a gun. I don't. And we clearly see him though, standing there with a gun pointing at Jim Gordon. Okay. So we're confused. He's confused. We know something's off. A train is barreling down the subway. All of this escalating at once. Are they on the tracks? They're no, they're not. They're next okay. to the subway. Got it. And one thing to to note is this guy who's standing there that Jim Gordon is pointing his gun at is there's a big electrical box behind him. So, you know, put it down, put it down. And it looks like from at least from Jim's perspective that this guy's going to fire this gun. Jim fires. He hits this electrical box behind the guy. Explosions. All Everything goes wrong. He's like, I can't, you know, Jim's like, I can't believe I hit that. I didn't mean to. Whatever it was. The tracks power line shuts down and we hear this subway train is still barreling forward just gunning it gunning it gunning it jim's suddenly realizing what's happened the tracks are not shifting they're not changing because what we don't know until just now is on the other side of the track is another subway train coming in the opposite direction typically the tracks would change they would never come even close to each other the power is down because of this bullet they're bolting at each other full speed jim runs out of there last second but but superman's there the, right no so the subway cars collide massacre death uh. on a massive scale and because of this fallout they had they arrest jim gordon oh snap they arrest him the commissioner is now under arrest he's thrown in jail we start to see kind of this very game of thrones esque style of these kind of these lieutenants who never really liked jim are vying for power oh, of who's okay. gonna get the uh, who's gonna get this new position of commissioner the, yeah job opening batman of course is very batman as being like uh jim didn't kill all these people i mean and jim's completely down in the dumps of course i did i did this very self-loathing yeah Batman's like there's shenanigans going on i'm gonna figure this out everybody's telling batman he's wrong and that jim made a mistake but of course he's gonna dive into this and of course yeah. his readers we probably know something's up that's a decent chance decent decent chance that jim gordon didn't just kill like hundreds of people yeah or, multiple or dozens, hundreds mo- many many people M- more than 100 Two full subway cars full yeah of people um and before our issue runs out if it's not in the first issue or in the second we get our hook of who is this man who's been meeting with like yeah. mayors or shady people on rooftops who is this villain it's none other than carmine falcone Okay. Falcone, who was driven out a long time ago out of yeah. the out of the city, has returned to usurp and regain his control and power in Gotham. Interesting. And he is now this force behind shadily what's happened. And he's also the hand behind we find out a new lieutenant is promoted to commissioner oh, who's in yeah. his pocket. And this lieutenant's first deal is we're bringing Batman down. Yeah. So, now, Carmen Falcone, for those who may not know, is a gangster who kind of represents old crime. Yeah. And his sort of removal from Gotham kind of represents the end of old crime, you know, the end of the mobs as we know mm-hmm. it. He was and, one of the first antagonists that Batman came up against. And he, yeah. he was very much that, that mob threat that he removed before yeah. characters like the Joker and Scarecrow, these supervillains came to town. E- exactly. And he actually represents that very much in Batman Begins, where he mm-hmm. played brilliantly by, by Tom Wilkinson. Right. Um yeah, that's interesting that he's back. And, you know, to have a gangster be a threat for Batman is you got to have some plans in in your pocket. Yeah. You got to know what's going on. They lay it out pretty nicely and okay. it's it's very well done. So, I definitely recommend checking out Batman Eternal. Great. All right, Mike. So, what what have you got on your pull list? Uh my comic that I'm referring to today is called uh, Velvet. It's from Image. It's for um written by Ed Brubaker and drawn by Steve Epting. I heard about this a little bit. Yeah, now Brubaker and Epting uh worked on Captain America it sort of early 2000s and they actually created the winter soldier right was the influence for the movie the winter soldier obviously Mm -hmm. very influential on captain america uh they've worked together a little bit since then but they have a new comic that's sort of a 70s spy drama Mm. but the hook basically is you know not the same names obviously her name is uh, her name is velvet not money penny but the premise is basically what if money penny was framed for james bond's murder Oh, wow. So she's this, you know, secretary who's been working in this British government agency mm-hmm. and worked with multiple different agents under all of the same kind of code Now, name. were all these agents James Bondy-esque? They were, they were kind of evocative of, of different Bonds. Now, they don't get super expensive. Like, that's the Roger Moore one, and it's not so far. Um, <laughs> that would be great if they were just passing by faces <laughs> of all the different they got. Bond they've characters. all got a specially... They're specifically like Connery, particularly. Like okay. He's the big influence, because of course he is. Of course. But one of them, I think, looks a little more like Timothy Dalton, and I almost wonder if that's deliberate or just... Right. But you get the sense, like, you know, the she's had relationships fun. with all of them to some degree. Oh. Now, Moneypenny 
in the movies doesn't have relationships. It's with Bob. hinted at this kind of Flirting. sexual tension, but it never nothing ever comes of it. She's right. the one woman who's not like gonna sleep with them. She's yeah. just like, no, 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 you do your thing and go, you know, risk your life and die for country and have sex with women who I assume are not tested and i'll just go keep doing my thing and not being a part of that i'll keep following this stuff i'll just keep filing things and not dying yeah um but basically the the um the james bond analog is is killed and everyone's trying to figure out what's going on Mm -hmm. and it ends up kind of pinning on her and we find out that she is entirely more capable than anyone thought she was oh. now she, is this like she's secretly a badass or she just doesn't realize that she's been this she good? no one know that she knows she's a former agent oh except for like her boss so she's like a double agent in an agent well she's like she retired she retired oh, to death's okay. life very much like actually what happens in skyfall spoiler alert for that movie the, the <laughs> sorry but <laughs> the money penny it's a very minor spoiler but the money penny kind of right, character right. in that she is was a, in too deep yeah, well, no, she, she kind of, it wasn't for her. And right. actually, she had a really bad, we get into it in future issues, mm-hmm. you know, by issue f- well, of course. four or five, you get the sense of, like, why she retired. But she's awesome. She is so good at what she does. That's awesome. And, like, you just get to see her in action and, like, the people that she meets. Like, she's got old contacts from her days. And her days were a long time ago. It's the 70s, and she was active in, like, the 50s. It may even be the 80s by now, but I think it's 70s. Hmm. Um, it's very much of the Avengers, you know, the 70s British TV show Avengers sort of format. Oh, that that style. Avengers. Yeah, it's very much kind of in that it's kind of style of, like, that era. Mm-hmm. You have, like, more, not get smart, but you're kind of in the same ballpark. Right. 60s and 70s. So her contacts are not fresh as a daisy. Yeah, like her old arms dealer is like, he's got a saggy gut and he's like, I don't really, I, I don't have the stamina for some of this anymore. It's like, almost like if Red was good. It's almost like if Red was good. Like she's not that old. Okay. But she's got like a gray streak, but she's still like, you know, 50s. Right. Maybe at, at, or so. Okay. Very much in keeping with the woman who, I can't remember her name, but she did play Money Penny from like Dr. No. Maybe not Dr. No. I don't think Money Penny's in Dr. No. But from the first movies all the way through to if you the know end if of Roger Money Moore, Penny is in Doctor No, please. I, shoot I mean, I have email. a computer right here. I could Google it. I'm just too lazy. <laughs> well, that's not. Nice. <laughs> it's not important. Like she played the same role for like 20 years, just like mm-hmm. Desmond Llewellyn did with Q, and then she was later on recast with 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 younger actresses as, as years went on. Mm-hmm. But it's sort of in the keeping of like that version of Money Penny. Okay. Like, what if she was the one? Like you saw her get older. You saw her get to meet these bonds and have relationships and dynamics. And now all the agents are gunning for her, and she's got a book it, and she's so got to figure out what's going on. So it's very framed that she w- might have killed Bond. We, no, we know, we know, we know that she, she didn't, didn't but, but everybody else, it's very well laid out that it, is like, it was definitely her. damning evidence. Wow. Yeah, for sure. Well, when you, yeah, it all pinned right on her, very conveniently so, and she doesn't know who or why or how, and she starts to realize that whoever pinned, you know, framed her as she's going through, this might have been a long time coming. Hmm. This might have been on her shoulders long before she realized that someone's been screwing with her for a while. And that's, that's sort of, cool. you don't, you know, I, I don't want to say more than that. Right, and obviously right. there's more that I don't know. Well, you know, I'm five or six issues in, mm-hmm. but it's really terrific. Brubaker is terrific at espionage. Cloak it's some and dagger stuff, he's the He's king. so terrific at that stuff. Um, he's great with, you know, when you do Incognito mm-hmm. or um, Sleeper, like he's just great at spy stories and, and crime stories crime is his bread and butter mm-hmm. he's been running a comic called criminal for you know 12 years or something at this point and always fresh new ideas he's just he's fantastic but there's this really fun kinetic sense because you get the sense like we haven't seen like an exploding pen or anything right but we know there's there's technology out there that's mm-hmm. like not what we have <laughs> oh really like, like beyond what we have like right in now. the second issue we get the reference of a stealth suit Okay, and it's like, oh, okay, so it's that we're right. in a we're in a James Bond world. Yeah, <laughs> we're right. definitely gonna see a stealth suit at some point. No, it's like a flying car. Uh, it's a flying stealth suit. Oh, well, flying. So stealth it's like suit. it's like um, it's like bulletproof. It the, it doesn't have like a jetpack or anything. It's got like uh, um, Rocky and Bullwinkle wings, like flying what? raccoon wings. That's awesome. it's, well, it's what Nick Fury used to wear, basically. Okay, but it's bulletproof. But it's like it kind of deflects her. I'm trying to remember if it's actually a stealth. I think it's just like body heat and stuff. Um, and she's like, I hope this still works. As she not jumps a, out a window. A, oh, and it's, and it's an old prototype. <laughs> she, I mean, she hasn't tried it in a while. <laughs> like, yeah, wow. you don't. We don't know what's gonna happen. It's next. nice to just have, you know, a stealth bulletproof suit. Just well, lying when you're around. investigating the murder of James Bond, you're gonna bring your stealth. You're gonna right, bring your right. flying suits. <laughs> you don't know game. what's gonna happen. Um, it's just so well done, guys, and it's really this terrific commentary on James Bond and on Money Penny and this character. Who, again, it's not Money Penny, but it's an interesting 
what if yeah. on this sort of non-character mm-hmm. from James Bond and just like, all right, what if we did the focus on her and she's the awesomest character? <laughs> right. Like ignore M, ignore Q, ignore Bond. Just money this pennies. Is, this money is pennies. a character to follow. Awesome. That's yeah. awesome. It's right. so well done, guys. Definitely check out Velvet by Image Comics uh, and Brew Baker and Steve Epting. All right, man. Well, that's great. Well, for everyone, please check out Batman Eternal and Velvet. And now I think what we're going to do is move into our main segment. Mike, take it away. All right. Incredible Hulk number one through six. Where we get like like ten different Hulks. Today we're going to be talking about the first six issues of Incredible Hulk from the 1962-1963, uh, you know, classic Marvel. Okay. Um, written by Stan Lee, drawn by Jack Kirby, except issue six is actually Steve Ditko, who uh, co-created uh, Spider-Man. Um, Steve and Jack Kirby, I mean, it's yeah, I mean, a bad combo. No, we've got some good, uh, got some good stories here. The thing that the reason we're talking about this today is that it's very clear, very quickly when reading these, no one had any idea what they were doing. This is just normally they were flying by the seat of their pants, and you can kind of tell like the Fantastic Four fight spies early on, and it's like communist spies, okay. because that's what they were doing and fighting like you know that was the big thing with the space race that's what they represented then spider-man fights spies and very quickly it's like oh no that doesn't work at all no 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 yeah spider-man no. and spies spider-man the can old, age-old battle like the first issue of spider-man not amazing fantasy 15 but the first issue of the spider-man comic okay he saves a um a rocket ship you know j jonas jameson's son saves his rocket and he rides it and it's like oh what? this is so weird like guys this is not who he should be like he's like dealing with like maybe alien invasions and stuff so he's like they're trying to do like a superman with spider-man well they're just like, kind of throwing everything at the wall like right. that would be a great fantastic four story yeah of but course. it doesn't really work as well for spider-man you don't see spider-man go in space that often i mean we don't now yeah <laughs> but back then anyone could go into space at any time and no it wasn't weird yet because it was just... He have that space Spider-Man suit on call at any time. Exactly. He didn't ride it all the way into space. He just... He got super high in the atmosphere. Right. <laughs> it's weird. But, um... And then we've not talked about the first issue of Incredible Hulk, but it's kind of well known what happens in it, in that it wasn't quite the Hulk that we know. So, the story is, you know, he's a scientist. Bruce Banner is a scientist working with the Army to develop a gamma bomb. This young kid, Rick Jones, drives onto the testing ground... Bruce runs out to save him, but there's a, again, Soviet spy in, uh. in the base who doesn't stop the countdown because A, he's a spy, and B, he wants the girl that Bruce wants. So, like, as if one villain motivation wasn't enough. Right. He's got both. Um, so he gets blasted with all this cosmic, or not cosmic, that's the Fantastic Four. <laughs> he gets blasted with all this gamma radiation, mm-hmm. and that night he turns into the Hulk. Okay. Now, the Hulk isn't the Hulk that we know. It's pretty well known that early Hulk was gray, mm-hmm. and the printer literally just had a problem with gray. Sometimes it was black or white or purple, and they were like, it's really inconsistent, Stan. We need a better color. And he's like, mm, green. Green's like a monster color. The whole design of him is meant to be like fe- the Frankenstein. Frankenstein's a monster. Right. So gray very much works with how he's generally depicted and Boris Karloff with the black and white. Green kind of plays into the Frankenstein we see in Halloween. Yeah. Green skin, and it still very much worked. So it, in the second issue, he's green. In the first issue, he kind of speaks in full sentences. You know, he'll say things like, just like all the other weak, helpless creatures, bah, puny humans. Like, it's just kind of how he talks. He also transforms at night. Only at night? Only at night. That's weird. Yeah, he doesn't transform when he's angry. He just transforms. So the anger thing wasn't even part of it at the very beginning. No, not in issue one. He just transforms when, it's not even when the moon's out. It's just every night he turns into the Hulk. Man never gets a good night of sleep. No, he can't. He I can't imagine he wakes up well rested. He's like, ah, uh, smashed a couple trucks. Feel like my nerves are on fire. That's good. <laughs> Feel good, guys. Why am I in this crater? What, what did I do last night? Um, in the second issue, you know, Rick and Bruce are taking this cave mm-hmm. and building this big stone door. Okay. Which like this big pressurized door that he cannot open. And it's on a time lock. To keep him in there, basically. So basically, night. every night he goes in there, they seal it, and he just pounds on the walls. So even by second issue, he's still the Hulk who turns Still Hulk, Hulk who Hulk turns at night. at night. Okay. Exactly. And then toad men from space show up. Uh, wait, what? <laughs> the, the issue, too, is about toad men from space. And you know this because they tell you, they introduce themselves as 
Toad men from <laughs> we space. We are toad men from space. <laughs> they don't say, we are the scrolls, we are the Kree, right. we are the Chitauri. We are toad men from space. Right. It's really, it's shocking because you look like toad men from space. It would space. be like if we went to another planet and it was populated by like banana creatures and we just showed up and we were like, we are the human looking things from space. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's like, we are the pink hot dogs. Like, <laughs> we are. <laughs> oh, but that's what I was going to call you. So of course. We're all on we the have, same page. Ah, all right. There's no confusion. We have small versions of you on this planet, and you, of course. It's not like anyone says, like, oh, the translator's not working. We might have said toad men. Did that, did that come out that way? No, no one drops a line of translators. It's just, we're toad men from space. Hmm. But the Hulk fights them. You know, he, he fights them, and he does his, you know... Uh, smashing. Smashing. And then he crashes back to Earth, he has another scene. He science them away. He sciences them away. Yeah. He literally uses magnets and just pushes them away. That makes sense, right? <laughs> it's the, uh, oh, Stanley man. had read like one thing about like magnets, right? That's like a thing. And I think he read just... the covers of a lot of science journals. <laughs> <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> magnets, the this world's week... greatest revolution. <laughs> this week, magnets. <laughs> this week, point. gamma radiation. He just writes it down and just walks away. Perfect. Here we go. <laughs> he just rips the cover off. Hey, where are you going? This is what we're doing this week. You ripped off. The... You ruined this comic. You ruined this magazine. That's two pennies. I can't imagine his writing processes. I found this toad on the way to work, and I also found the cover of this newspaper. It's talking about magnet sales. Excelsior. <laughs> Excelsior. Um, Throws it on their desk. Issue three, the army comes to Rick Jones, who again is unambiguously the sidekick of both the Hulk and Bruce Banner, Weird. <laughs> and and goes to them and says, look, we want to test this rocket, and only the Hulk can do the job. If you release him from his chamber Container. that we somehow know about and lead him to this rocket, we can test the rocket and, and, and do the thing. And he does it and gets Hulk into the ship and they send it away and Ross is like, great, we're just set the Hulk into space. This will solve all our problems. Why did no one think that was the plan? Like, why did no one think at any point? Like, Look, we've tried to stop you a few times already, but we're promised we're totally legit this time. Yeah, it's also the premise of Planet Hulk. Yeah, I was just to about to say, I was like, space. this didn't work the first time, so there's, you know, Strange and Iron Man were like, we should just throw him into space again, right? Yeah. What the worst could happen? But then he's on the ship, and Bruce Banner is trying, he turns into Bruce Banner, he's trying to figure out how to f- reverse the rocket. trying to science the ship. Meanwhile, Rick Jones you know, realizes he's been double-crossed and sneaks into the control room. He is not left... He's left unattended because of... Because grievi- why not? Because reasons. Yeah. Is he only a teenager on an army base? <laughs> well, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> what's, the, what's the problem? Well, please note that this is also an army base that has gamma bombs yeah. available. So Rick Jones also tries to turn the rocket around, and there's a jolt. And the jolt transfers to Bruce Banner. Somehow through the science, through the signal, he's... Tra- he's. I thought you were about to say through the science. Through the science. Through the science it happens. Basically through the science, because he's trying to reverse... He's going to try to turn the rocket course, and so is Bruce, and they both get this jolt. Okay. And Bruce passes through cosmic rays, because I guess they're still out there, like the same so cosmic rays. So now we're getting cosmic rays. <laughs> yeah. They're just out there in space. Now you're going to want to make a right when you get over here, because you're not going to hit those cosmic rays, so... You know the... The Fantastic Four ran into cosmic rays? Are those things still out there? I don't know. Let's find out. Oh, no! Cosmic rays! Still here. When he lands, Hulk smashes out. And it's day. Oh. It's, it's daylight and the Hulk smashes out. And he's going after Rick. And Rick's like, no, no, stop! And he stops. He just stands there. Hmm. And Rick goes, oh, oh. Raise your right arm. And Hulk raises his right arm. Sit down. And Hulk sits down. Rick Jones has a Hulk. What? Rick Jones now has control of the Hulk with his mind. Wait, did he gain cosmic? Or it's just the Hulk's doing whatever he's saying? The Hulk, because of the jolt. Because of that jolt. Their connection, basically? They're, they have a connection now. Oh. And but the, here's the problem. When Rick goes to sleep, Hulk just smashes stuff. So now he's just perma-Hulk. It's just Hulk all the time. He just does not change back. He just stands there like a robot. Just until, completely... Until he falls asleep. Until he falls asleep or until you tell him to do something else. Wow. And that's like the first story. And the second part of that, it's still issue three, but now we have like two-part stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hulk basically fights the circus. He fights the circus? Here's the thing. Barman Every... Bailey's got their elephants out there. They're doing some tightrope tricks. Here's the thing. I'm actually going to write about this for the blog. Everybody fights the circus. Show. Oh, so this is a bad circus. Yeah. This isn't just the Hulk just breaks into a nice circus no. and starts punching people. Rick, you know, you, you go to the circus, mm-hmm. ringleader hypnotizes you, okay. and then they steal everything you have, and then they go into the town, which is now unoccupied. Right, because they're all the Because circus. they're all the circus, and they just steal everything there. And no Pretty one suspects the circus. for the ringleader. Until you hypnotize the guy with mind control over the Hulk. 
Right. Because in his last moments, he was like, oh, no, I'm being hypnotized. Hulk, so come basically, help. And Hulk just comes in and raises hell. Wow. And there's a fantastic shot where the guy, the human cannonball, mm-hmm. you know, gets in his cannon, and he's got a Thor hammer. I don't know if Thor had premiered at this point. I'd have what? to check the dates, but he's got a hammer. Like that a looks, Thor-sized hammer. No, he's got a hammer that looks exactly like what Thor has. Okay. The exact same design, because Weird. Jack Kirby drew it. No one will remember that I included this in a circus <laughs> fight comic. And there's this great shot. Of you know you're we're behind the guy the cannonball mm-hmm. he's being thrown at the Hulk and Hulk is like reeling back like he's either falling or winding up for a punch okay and the next shot is the outside of the tent and the human cannonball <laughs> just popping out the top <laughs> like just straight That's into awesome. the air straight up and the hammer just twists rolling away That's pretty it's, great it's amazing <laughs> well they had a lot of fun with that issue and then they 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 capture the Hulk which mm-hmm. is a thing that. I think everyone does in every story from now to the register of this episode. Everyone captures the Hulk. Okay. <laughs> um, issue four, an alien gladiator shows up and just challenges us because that's what they do. Yeah. And Bruce is like, all right, I'm going to turn myself into the Hulk, you know, to, to, you know, to fight him. Turns out it's a commie plot. It's not really an alien ga- alien communist it's literally like a big this alien this is the real fruition of their plan it started with hitting him with the gamma bomb exactly now all coming back to the gladiator from space commies were everywhere man Apparently. they just did everything issue five though we're really starting to get a sense they have different identities mm-hmm. hulk kind of does think of bruce as someone other okay anyway betty you know the hulk bruce is back to work i imagine he took like several weeks off and just showed up he's like yeah guys you know the bathroom i mean what London, where was I? What are we doing? Uh, we're working on hunting the Hulk. Great, I will help you with that. And Betty shows up and she's like, "Oh, you know, this is my new boyfriend. He's an archaeologist. His name is Mr. Tyrannus." You're not even trying. <laughs> his Mr. Tyrannus. His name is Tyrannus, and his code name is Mr. Tyrannus. Like what? You didn't even try. Like you're you're. He is an. We later find out he is an emperor from a subterranean world. What? Mister Tyrannus <laughs> is an emperor from a subterranean world who I guess just goes out on dates with random people and he just finds? abducts ladies. What? And then like the Hulk, you know, he basically they, he's just mechs foul play. Bruce is like, oh, I don't trust him, and they're driving <laughs> after him. I don't him. trust <laughs> this guy named Mister Tyrannus. No, what is he? Oh, he's an archaeologist. He didn't have any archaeologist tools. We should follow him. His name is Tyrannus. His name Bruce. is Tyrannus. I mean, I have to imagine an emperor from some, you know, he's got to be doing some weird, shady stuff other than he didn't have archaeologist tools. You you are the third smartest person on the planet. Uh, <laughs> Why did you not figure it out? His name's Dr. Ty- Mr. Tyrannus. Oh, man. Uh, actually, the only thing that would have been more sinister is Dr. Tyrannus. Yeah, basically. Fair. Which oh, he should have been. He should have been. He's because an archaeologist. He's an archaeologist. He probably had a degree. But he abducts Maybe. her Maybe. down into the earth, which I guess he's an archaeologist. That right. kind of works. Yeah, I, sure. Screw it. He has an underworld. He's got an underground culture, and mm-hmm. Hulk follows him, but they capture the Hulk, and they make him fight in a gladiator fight. Of course they do. It's straight up Planet Hulk. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's the story. That's, okay. that's issue six, and this is the one that's actually drawn by Steve Ditko. And here's the thing: drawn by doesn't mean I got a full script mm-hmm. in the '60s. It means that Stan and I talked about this story for an hour, and now I'm drawing twenty page, thirty pages of comics and sending it to him. At best, wow. At worst, it's I got a phone call. <laughs> Um, this is where we're going with this. It was literally sometimes it would be like Daredevil would be draw or Spider Man actually it would be like you know hey next issue uh, the villain's the kingpin go Johnny do your thing wow that was the Marvel method because Stan Lee was writing you know quote unquote writing twelve books or something like that it was he was writing Thor and Fantastic Four and Hulk and Spider Man and, and X Men and Daredevil it's kind of why X Men and you know was not so good early on it's right. kind of spread pretty thin but there was no way you could have written. 30 pages of script or whatever. Of course. The Marvel method at its finest is that Steve Dicko and Stanley had a huge falling out and then wrote 10 of the best issues of comics while never speaking to each other. That's pretty awesome. They just wouldn't ever speak. Like, he'd drop off his pages, he'd be like, and they're like, hey, do you want to talk to Stan? He's like, no. He's got my notes. Issue six, they fight an alien named the Metal Master. Hmm. He turns, Bruce turns himself into the Hulk. His face is Banner's face. Whoa. It's pink. And it's Banner's face. And he's, like, looking in the mirror. He's like, ah! But the rest of him's green. Yeah, green and Hulk shapes. Okay. So he puts on a Hulk mask. He ha- Now, does he have this Hulk mask just lying around? He I mean, makes he one, he, fashions he one? He picks up a Hulk mask and says, I'll do this. Here we go. Wow. I mean, 
I gotta imagine now that there's like this Roswell culture at this point. It's it's happened fast. That's my explanation for the Hulk mask. Sure. I have none other to give you. <laughs> I have no other explanation for that mask. It is canon now. Yeah. Um, but then he goes and he fights and he gets captured. They mm. always capture him. He is captured. You're I don't right. Understand. He is captured constantly. But they, he gets captured and they pull off his mask. The army captures him. They pull off mm-hmm. his mask and they're like, oh, he's wearing a Hulk mask. And they pull it off. Oh, it was just a Hulk face. Okay, we're fine. Because now he's back to having a Hulk face. For no reason. They never explain it. <laughs> it's just arbitrary. But, like, he's, it's just back to normal now. Okay. And then he later escapes, because of course he does. Mm-hmm. But it leaves Banner. And every time he changes, he looks really re- weary and haggard. And he's looking at this thing and he goes, These gamma rays, these are unpredictable. I don't know what's going to happen next. And I'll tell you what happens next. The book gets canceled. What? <laughs> that's the end. That's the end of the six issue series of Incredible Hulk. To recap, he becomes the Hulk. Gray. He is gray first. Then he is now green. Why not? Still turns at night. Still turns at night into the Hulk. Not when he's angry. Mm-hmm. Um, he is relatively intelligent. Not. Yeah. Not uh, not like bah, Hulk smash. It's not um, Hulk smash. It's Hulk. You know, get away from me, you puny humans. You right. can't he's possibly calling fathom. Beauty. Yeah. He is uh, shot into space with a rocket. He becomes under control of Rick Jones. He goes into space two times. Two times. That's right. <laughs> um, and then he now is shooting himself up with gamma rays to turn to Bruce, then into the Hulk. And now at the end, it's just canceled. Yeah. All right. Well, that was a pretty interesting main segment. Look, guys. They're not always winners when Stanley and Jack Kirby <laughs> get together. It's not always okay. right out the gate. But they are interesting. Anyways, so that was our men's main segment. Now we're <laughs> going to be moving on to one of our game segments that we have. And for this episode, it is Super Mundane. Uh, every other episode, we do a game segment called Super Mundane, where usually Jay will give a prompt of what hero would be the best at some mundane activity something uh, best man at a wedding uh you know etc t- leading an elementary school musical he's gonna give a prompt and we're gonna figure out which hero would be the best at it and we've added this since last week or i guess last there are two episodes ago which would be the worst at it exactly because we decided that constant time would be the worst best man at a wedding and superman is the best best man i've thought about it since deadpool would be second worst okay that he, is he's true second worst but still, I think that you hit the nail on the head. You have a better chance of making it out of a Deadpool right. wedding. <laughs> All right, so the super mundane for this week yeah. is who would be the best at chaperoning a co-ed sleepover? Oh, it's a co-ed sleepover. Co-ed sleepover. Because there's not much chaperoning to do unless your kids are superheroes themselves. I think that actually brings us right to the X-Men. Because really? we have to talk about the X-Men in this context, because That's the X-Men true. are always graduating from... And they are in a co-ed house. They're mansion. in a co-ed dorm, and you you become a student, and then you become a teacher more often than not. Mm-hmm. There's, that's pretty high turnaround. Actually, it's not. Most of, mostly you die. But um, <laughs> but you become a student, you become a teacher, and you start like you know educating the kids and keeping track of them. Right. Wolverine is your deterrent. <laughs> Wolverine, and you know is the guy who's going to sleep. What are you guys doing in there? You know, you know, he doesn't even say it. He just sleeps in between the hallways. He's just sitting there, and the kids are sneaking past. He, you know, he's got, like, the cigar just sticking out. He's got the cowboy hat sitting on his face. That's what the silhouette is. It's the middle of the night. You just see just the glow of the cigar at the end of the hall. But he's, like, slumped down against the floor, and the kids are walking by, and they're like, oh, he's asleep. And then you see her, snicked. Ah, oh, he's not asleep. Go back to bed. Go back to bed. Go back to the room. <laughs> so that's, he's a pretty solid choice right off the bat. Right. Um, the only thing is, in a school filled with mutants, I mean, Kitty Pride's got an easy out of just yeah, doing that one right there. That's exactly. She's going to sneak over to Colossus's room. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, we are assuming the worst about these kids, but we're also assuming, you know, maybe they're just playing spin the bottle in the attic. Like, right, we don't know. The point is that you want to make sure nothing gets too cray cray. Mm-hmm. You know, all these kids are, you know, taken care of. Again, Spider Man is the wrong answer. <laughs> Spider-Man is the wrong answer. Spider-Man is maybe the most irresponsible person ever Mm -hmm. of all of them. But not on purpose. No, he's just, he just can't help it. His superpower, as we've noted before, it is terrible luck. Yeah, it's, it's just by virtue of the fact if you're chaperoning a co-ed sleepover, Kraven's gonna show up. Like, that's just what's going to happen. Or the Green Goblin has poisoned something. Again, Superman, he's got the x-ray vision, so he can Mm -hmm. always check. But you know, he's not gonna x-ray vision the girl's dorm. That's true. He's not gonna do that. That's also a little weird. Yeah. Yeah. He's so just, that's true. He's not going to do that. So also Superman, I feel like, you know, he's a bit more lax 
he might be not with necessarily rules like he's lax against he's not lax against justice and things no like no that. no but, but i'm mean, like if oh, some kid, kids if some right? kid gets up to you know in the middle of the night to sneak down and grab a glass of milk he might just be like wink go about your day remember timmy you want to always, uh, you know, lean in first. <laughs> Maybe you might not give that. Go ninety percent. Let her come. Go ninety percent. In this scenario, uh, he's played by Will Smith. Right. He's um, tossing the hair a little bit. I'm inclined to say Daredevil. I was gonna say Daredevil. I think is probably because here's pick. the thing: he's a ninja. Right. So in those dark halls, like he's just gonna sneak in. He's gonna have fun. He's gonna do his thing, mm-hmm. but he's gonna hear those kids from anywhere in the house. He's not spying on them in a pervy. No, he's just hearing know. when doors open, people walking. It's not anything to do with vision. He can get to them super quietly and just stand behind them and go, "Hey, Lonnie." <laughs> oh, probably not the doing? best idea. Maybe, uh, maybe go back to bed. I ha- I carry Billy clubs. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing: the guy. I think the importance of also being the best chaperone in a co-ed sleepover is also making sure they're having a good time too. You don't want to be. Wolverine's great, but you don't also want to scare the kids to death. You know? Yeah, Wolverine's de- idea of fun might be, hey, here's guns. Yeah, right. Run. Like, <laughs> have fun. Here's a hedge maze and guns. Exactly. Well, what are we doing, Mr. Wolverine? I wanted to go out in the middle of the night. I'm showing you what we do. Snick, snick. Yeah. Yeah. While Daredevil- I'll give you two minutes. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> While Daredevil Those is- kids are sleeping sound that night. Yeah, they're, they're sleeping gonna really run, well. He's going to run them ragged. <laughs> While Daredevil is a lawyer, he's charming, and mm-hmm. he keeps a fairly positive, upbeat attitude, so even if he does have to discipline at any time, he's probably going to do it the correct way. I think probably so. Probably give the right point of view. I'm also thinking specifically, we were just talked about Mark Wade and his Daredevil run. There's that issue from a couple of years ago, the Christmas episode issue, where mm-hmm. the uh, bus crashes, the bus of all the blind kids that he is chaperone. Right, right. And he has to lead them and through the snow, and it's like, you know just driving snow and he's you know barely keeping them together and he manages to inspire them to stay together and like we've seen him be good at his job yeah he's good with we kids. have not historically seen the x-men be the best chaperones that's true <laughs> Espe- yep that's- x-men chaperoning tends to be oh we're going on a mission i guess you better come along because mm-hmm. we can't very well leave you at home except when they do the first episode of the x-men cartoon they leave jubilee at home with Sabretooth. they they what they leave Jubilee at home with Sabretooth. Wow. Like, in the house. And maybe not the first episode, but it's like the first three. That's not smart. She's not a member of the team. No. She's just there. Like, that's their approach. They took Kitty Pride with them whenever they went to, you know, whatever crazy adventures. Their idea of shepherding is, well, here's a spandex costume. <laughs> Let's it's see yellow. how you do. It's yellow and black, which means all the bullets are drawn straight to your body. Right. <laughs> so I have to say, if, if Daredevil is the best pick... For best uh, co-ed, I really think, and this might be a callback to a previous week, I think Gambit would actually be the worst yes. chaperone for a co-ed sleepover. He would just be, I feel like he'd be given tips and not necessarily... Yeah, he's an enabler. Yeah, that one. he's an enabler for no sure. No doubt. No doubt at all. Also, if someone does like, you know, uh, Gambit, what are you doing? Uh, you know, he might explode something because everything, as we've addressed before, is grenades. Or just be sleazy. If someone asks him, Remy, what are you doing? Uh, oh, just watching the kids sleep, Shetty. You know how it is. That's super creepy, Yeah, Remy. that is super Don't creepy. Don't do that, Remy. Yeah. Uh, you know, just uh, making sure they're they're tucked in their beds. You know, I can't do a Cajun accent. I'm not trying. But um, nor, sh- nor should anyone try <laughs> to do the Gambit accent. Okay, so we've got Daredevil, best at running at co-ed sleepover. Uh, chaperoning is co-ed chaperoning, sleepover. Not running. Yeah. <laughs> Guess what I set up, guys? No, yeah, chaperoning a co-ed sleepover. Gambit, definitely the worst. Absolutely the worst choice. All right. Well, everyone, that was episode five of Because Comics. We'll be posting a new episode every other week. If you'd like to download more episodes or check out other similar podcasts, head over to partialarc.com. That's arc with a C. Of course, you can email us any questions at becausecomics at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter and Instagram at because underscore comics. And be sure to check out more content from our comic boy wonder, Mike Christensen, at supergeekmike.com. Thanks for listening, and remember, you can't spell team without meat. That's very true. <laughs> I mean, you can try. You, you can try. Yeah. Uh, you'll be very... Uh, now, spell team without meat, like if I was building a structure right. to spell the word team, I could use other things instead of meat. But if you're putting them. together a team, your team has to be made of meat. That's true. Yeah. What if my team was made of mostly brutes? Now see, because, 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 because comics.